Hey guys, welcome back to Fright Flicks. This is a new kind of video. This is going to be everything wrong with the final girls. The last episode, supposedly, of the entire first story arc season of Scream Queens. Uh, we don't typically like to give negative reviews, let alone I don't like the idea of borrowing, is a nice way I'll put it, borrowing a, another videos like Hook, I guess you could say, but I, I can't think of a another fucking way to put this. This is seriously going to be quite a long episode. There's a video index in the video description, so check that out. But we are going to go in-depth, deep into this. I just want to let you guys know we don't like being necessarily negative here on this channel. We really always try and find the positives. Tried really hard. I did find some positives. That should be interesting. I'll get into those in a bit. But for the most part, this did not go well at all. So, someone out there needs to point all this this stuff out and we are going to be doing that in probably as much detail as I possibly can. We have watched every single episode. We've debated every single episode. A lot of you guys already know this watching this video, but this is for people who might not be familiar with us at all. Okay. This should just show you right here. Nate is, as we call our dynamic here, Nate is the broad strokes guy. He watches the episode once, maybe twice, watches it with his girls. Then he reviews it as a, I'll say a big, but still casual fan. Me, I don't watch any other TV shows and I go really in depth with this stuff. I've seen every single episode at least six times. I'm not lying. I watch them over four hour spans. I take screenshots. I have endless files. Brad mentioned one time in an interview that there are people out there who make charts and really think all this stuff through and get crazy about it. I am that guy. So all of the negative stuff we're going to say does not come from uneducated, unresearched, off the cuff, mentality. Not at all. That is not how these video, this video was created. This is created by people who know this show. I'm going to say it better, it seems, after this last episode than the guys who wrote the show. So, settle in. This is going to be a long one. It is going to be the most negative you have ever heard either of us two other than Nate's The Gallows Review. Make sure you check that out. So, no more delaying this fucking horrible experience. This video should be fun, but you know what I mean if you watch the final. So let's get right into this. We're going to start with Nate's review and then I will be back for my quote unquote review and further analysis, viewer questions, all types of stuff. Let's hear what Nate thought. You know, just to get things rolling, first of all, I do not like to swear when I record my reviews. Swearing just to swear, it's not for me. However, that said, I'm going to use a little salty language in this review. I won't be able to help myself. It won't be as a placeholder. It'll be coming from emotional place. Let's talk the final girls, the final episode of Scream Queen Season 1, possibly the final episode ever. There was a lot on the line going into this. A lot of promises had been made, both off the air, in promotional materials, and on the air. A lot of storylines, a lot of characters, a lot of deaths... A lot of things to be wrapped up. Who is the final Red Devil Killer? Well, for some reason, the finale of Scream Queens was handed off. It wasn't written by the, the regular team of Ryan Murphy, Ian Brennan, Brad Falchuk, uh, the creators of the show. They decided to hand it off to the writing staff of Family Guy. And they gave them 30 minutes to write it in a bar on a napkin soaked with Red Bull and vodkas, apparently. Because it's all wrong. It's, a, it's, the, it's the wrong kind of joke. It turns the show itself into a joke. It, make it it makes it seem like the people making the show think that the show is a joke. Our, the character names are all there. Their names are, are done properly. Uh, the acting talent brings their A-game, as they have always done every single episode this season, a really great ensemble comedy cast. But the, the humor is gone. The show itself is a joke. The jokes themselves, within the context of the show, are flat, if, if they're even there at all. The pacing is non-existent and, and amateurish, at best. Uh, characters shift wildly in demeanor and personality from, from scene to scene. There's no internal consistency within scenes themselves, set aside the overall episode or, or the season as a whole. I mean, they can't even keep consistency from line to line this episode. The entire thing feels 
so rushed and, and impromptu down to the sets uh, and appearances of side characters and, and how people are, are written out. Top of all that, I mean, you strip away the humor, which is the, str- the show's strong suit, but there's also no deaths. No deaths of substance. There is a flashback in which we see Gigi get a kill, and it's a great moment, possibly the best moment of this finale, where she repeatedly, brutally stabs this guy to death to steal his Red Devil costume. And the actress just totally sells it and makes it hilarious. Doesn't sound hilarious, it is. But we didn't know that guy. That's just some dude, like the pizza man in the last episode. They don't really count. You know, they're just set decoration. No characters died, and there are so many characters left. Basically, every single important character, with the exception of possibly Pete, is still alive, and all of them end up the show alive. But, (laughs) no humor, no deaths, those are part of it. But that's not the whole reason why this episode sucks. And it does suck. And before I get into specifics, I am going to go over the episode, sort of break it down a little bit, scene by scene. Maybe not not that detailed, but I'm going to go through it and hit the couple of high points. And there are three, and the multiple low points. But why this episode sucks is it wasn't fun. And I don't mean funny. Usually, Scream Queens makes me laugh. Like I said, the humor is great. But this episode lost its sense of fun. It seemed to, all of a sudden, it forgot what brought it to the dance. It forgot what side its bread was fucking buttered on. Above all, the show is, it's a comedy, it's also a bloody whodunit. You could say it's horror, it isn't really horror. It's inspired by horror. It's a bloody who done it you finally get to the final episode you have your big reveal not only do you have your big reveal it flashes back to the beginning includes all the past characters and it shows the entire master plan from beginning to end it fills in all the blanks it tells you everything you want to know it isn't fun it loses its sense of fun it is so concentrated on business on wrapping up the story which Side note, it does a poor job of that. It leaves so many dangling loose ends. that That's maddening in and of itself, but I could forgive it. If the show was fun, the show has made me overlook a lot of its sins in the past, just because I'm like, dude, who cares? It's hilarious. The show wasn't hilarious, nor was it fun. It was so concentrated on the nuts and bolts. They actually think that all of us tune in to watch the story. Let me, let me tell you something. Especially now that it's wrapped up, I've been thinking this the last few episodes anyway. The story for Scream Queens is crap. It's trite. It's cliche. It's been done a hundred times before. 99, ti- 99 of those times it was done fucking better. Doesn't really matter because it was fun. But no, they forgot to bring the fun this time. They're like, oh yeah, we need to... Uh, We need to go into really exhaustive detail and suck every bit of fun out of this reveal. And if that was their goal, then this episode was a a real victory because they succeeded. It, It wasn't fun at all. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of the episode. It starts by revealing that Hester is the killer. She is the final Red Devil. She is the other baby in the bathtub. She is Boone's twin sister. She was part of the criminal conspiracy with Gigi and Boone from the beginning, from childhood, where they were raised in an insane asylum by Gigi to be brutal killers. Boy, does this show miss Gigi. Boy, do I miss Gigi on this show. She had two or three scenes. It was so nice to have her back. It was it was like a, a breath of fresh air, all things considered, seeing as how stagnant and foul-smelling this episode is. Okay, so... They go into exhaustive detail about her coming up in the asylum. For some reason, Nick Jonas uh, is credited in the episode. He only does a voice for one scene. So there should have been a lot of Boone in this episode. There should have been a lot of things in this episode, goddammit. But one of those things was Boone. Boone Clemens should have been featured heavily in this episode. It would have made everything better, or at least a little better, a little more fun. But he wasn't there. Leah Michelle. As Hester, she stepped up her game, and she did her best. The material was just super weak, and there was too much of it. There was too much detail. They should have breezed through it. Need to see the origin of how she got the neck brace, which she never really needed. Doesn't really matter, right? In any event, 
They plow through and they show basically everything that we need to know about Hester and her plan and what brought her to Wallace University and, you know, what the three of them were up to the whole time and the steps they took and, all right, cool. Uh, not cool, really, but okay. So far, so good. Still think they've got something up their sleeve coming up. I was so wrong about that, but hope springs eternal within me. What can I say? Uh, they go from this into, um, what, you know, it, what's basically a locked room scene. It's at the end of a noir movie when the detective calls everybody together. So we get a lot of monologuing from several different characters. We've seen this before in a couple of different episodes in the series where people monologue and give their theories about who the killer is, and that's fine. However, it's not fine this time because we just saw who the killer is, and we just saw how they did it. So hearing these other theories, and then, worst of all, Lee Michelle gets a, a super, 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 super extra long monologue laying out proving, air quotes, how the three Chanel's are actually really guilty of being the Red Devil Killer, and she puts the frame on them. The thing is that she doesn't frame them with evidence. She frames them with anecdotes that make them seem guilty to the presence, in the presence of those hearing said anecdotes. And it's Denise, Chief of Police Denise is there, so that's all it takes for her to arrest some people. But it goes on forever, and there's no suspense there because we just saw who the killer is so hester spinning all these yarns about what everybody else did and how they did it it just drags on for fucking ever because we know it's all bullshit so it's like okay you're just filling time we get some some parents involved and uh for the first time in this episode we have an incident of uh, parents disowning their daughter all of a sudden because they think she's a bitch this happens twice in one episode it was ridiculous even within the context of scream queens the first time in this episode they do it a second time minor quibble you know it's like picking out one turd from a shit soup so on the basis of this anecdotal evidence, um, all three remaining Chanel's are dragged away in cuffs. Funny bit, since Denise is in charge of the police department, she hired, hired all male strippers, uh, the hot cops, to be the police force. The joke is a dead lift, like some in total stolen from Arrested Development, but it's still a good joke. And if you're going to steal, steal from the best. And it made it half funny. The second time seeing it on this show. There's a time jump here, which was also poorly done and only served to kill uh, narrative momentum. Just since I'm talking about how ridiculous all the police shit is with the Chanel's getting arrested based on what Hester said. Like, there's no evidence other than stuff that was, like, so obviously fabricated that this is the problem when you try and inject little pieces of reality into an absurdist show like Scream Queens. Because the Chanel's are put into the system, they're put on trial where they act as their own defense for some reason, although they all come from money. But they all act as their own defense, and then when it comes time to read the verdict, here is in particular where the family guy comparison comes into play. The forewoman of the jury stands up to read the verdict, and we see she's going to say not guilty, because that's what's checked on the form in front of her that she's going to read. Before she can read it, Chanel jumps up with one of her, um, at this point, trademark shouting abusive monologues running down the jury for not being peers. You know, They should be young, hot girls who are rich if they're going to be their peers. And, the, and what she says is so offensive that we see the forewoman scratch out not guilty and check the guilty box. All right, so that's a bad family guy joke right there. Then the forewoman proceeds to lecture Chanel. I know this is a little thing, but bear with me. It's just, it's uncommonly stupid. She begins to lecture Chanel and says something to the effect of that your entire defense has come down to screaming insults at the jury and uh, saying the, that you didn't do it. They talk about what a terrible defense they have, and yet the jury... Ten seconds before, in the previous cut, was still going to decide that they were not guilty until she said that they weren't her peers or something. So they tossed aside any sort of logic and went for a sight gag, which is fine if you're Family Guy. Everyone expects that from Family Guy. It's fine for Family Guy. Didn't play here. Played way too cartoonish, and I had well and 
truly admit Scream Queens gets cartoonish sometimes. And I don't have a problem with that. I did have a problem with this. It was a terrible scene. It was this scene, which happens pretty late in the episode. I'm jumping around a little bit. But it was this scene where I realized that the wheels had completely come off. And when I saw before the show was teetering, now it was... It had full-on fucking collapsed. It was the Hindenburg. It was a bridge disaster. Everything was over. And yet I was still... I was still hoping they could pull it out. I was still hoping there would be some... Some twist that they could throw that would... If not save the episode, then at least put a shine on it. So that I wouldn't have to finish up a great season of very funny TV with an hour of shit. Okay, so now we do the uh, the poorly timed time jump in which it's now May of 2016. Uh, Kappa is all better. Grace and Zayde are class presidents. And Hester is incredibly happy being the treasurer. She has finally found a real family. Although she still hasn't let Grace and uh, Wes Gardner know who she really is. Now, there are, at this point, there are still maybe 20 minutes left in the episode, so there's still a fairly substantial chunk of time if they wanted to do something. But at this point, the series is over. After the reveal of Hester, the show actually has nothing. And... Everything else is an epilogue in which they just noodle around and waste time. We do get a funny scene with Chad Radwell and Denise who are breaking up. They've been together for a few months. And, I mean, that's a crying shame because why didn't we get to see them together, like, a lot? They were the two overall funniest performers on this show week in and week out having them have a bunch of scenes together would have been gold we got just just a little taste of this and once again like the pete scene in the previous episode this felt made up on the spot i wouldn't be surprised if it was in improved like entirely and just because oh dude let's say that you guys were together for a few months and then you break up let's film your breakup scene go that's exactly how it feels and these two performers are strong enough that they can work some laughs out of it. It would be comedy gold, but honestly, it felt like the punchline to a great joke that that I never got to hear. Still, funny scene, funny improv between Chad Radwell, uh, played by Glenn Powell, overall my favorite character through this whole season, and uh, uh, Niecy Nash, uh, also very, very strong. Then we jump into the happy ending for Jamie Lee Curtis, Dean Munch, the murderer, liar, manipulator, great character. She was super strong as well this season. Um, it's interesting to me that like the two most unrepentant killers on the show get the two, you know, get they both get happy endings. Hester gets a happy ending, and. Dean Munch gets a happy ending. She gets the guy. You know, she gets Grace's dad, Wes. Um, she continues to run the school. She has a, a best-selling book. And then, another one of those inexplicable things. Once again, the specter of Family Guy coming into the scene. Dean Munch is giving us a voiceover about how the Red Devil Killer was ended up being really good, not just for her, but for the university. Now everything is very soft and lefty and sad sack and touchy-feely and all that. And she's basically saying all those people had to die, but the end result was really good for the school. Immediately, she decides to throw that all away by saying to Hester, I know it was you, and I'm going to turn you into the police. Like, this, this makes absolutely no sense on any on any level. Like, they just took the entire character of Dean Munch, and she was there, and then they passed the typewriter to the next guy in line who's like, who's Dean Munch? I don't know who that is. Oh, you know what would be good? If she sa- if she tells the killer that she knows who she is. That That's how it feels. Like, all of a sudden, Dean Munch is a different character. Who is stupid? This is something that my 8- and 10-year-old daughters pointed out repeatedly. Scream Queens exists in a world where it's filled by the people that live in horror movies that always do stupid shit. That's just what Scream Queens is. It's filled with movie stupid people. But Jamie Lee Curtis, Dean Munch, was never one of those people. She always seemed self-aware. She always seemed smart. And then now she's not. 
so she steps to Hester, and they have a scene where they decide, you know, blackmail each other. Oh, I know what you did. Oh, I know what you did. Oh, it's a stalemate, which they threw in specifically, I guess, just to be cutesy. And both actresses, you know, they carry their weight. It's just... The scene is poorly written, and it shouldn't have been there at all. It shouldn't have been there at all. It shouldn't have been there. Are, are you listening, writers? I, I guess when you when you have three guys write, I, I don't know who to direct this at, but whoever wrote this scene, come on, dude. You're better than this. I've watched your show all season. I know you're better than this. Okay, i got to calm down for a second here. It was just so goddamn stupid, you know? It's fine if the characters on your show are stupid. Don't give me an impression that the people behind the camera are equally so. No bueno, guys. And it didn't even add any new information to the mix. It just rehashed shit that we already knew. Okay, um, that scene, the throwdown between the two killers who remain, <laughs> um, comes on the heels of uh, the high point of the episode. Whenever possible, I like to give praise. I'm going to throw excessive praise on two little details because the episode overall was so bad these two details really just jumped out to set the scene Zayde, Grace, Hester are, are all polishing a memorial for the victims of the Red Devil Killer this is Jamie Lee Curtis comes up to them and has her conversation with Hester at the end of this I've discussed that shit pile but let me get to the good thing. So they're uh, cleaning this memorial. They mention that the memorial was paid for by the Radwells and that the inscription on said memorial was written by Chad. They did not need to say the inscription was written by Chad because the inscription is so beautifully, perfectly Chad that they didn't even need to explain it. The inscription reads, To our fellow students, we are super sorry that you are dead. We didn't know all of you that well, but some of you were hot. I always wanted to have sex with a deaf girl. Thank you. Um, greatest memorial inscription ever. Okay, immediately after this, Zede and Grace, Grace leave, because they need to leave so Hester can be alone and have her scene with Dean Munch. <laughs> As she's leaving, Zede tells Hester, who is, uh, polishing the marble of the memorial, hey, give Earl Grey's name a little extra love. It's an offhand comment. She says it as she walks past and leaves. Why did I love this? Why did I feel it was important? Up until this point on the show, one of the only characters that has shown anything approaching grief or sadness or remorse or um, any sort of human emotion about these murders has been Chad. The Kappas were the focus of the Reign of Terror, and a lot of them died, but none of the sisters cared about the deaths of other sisters. They they didn't. I mean, spin it all you like, even if they had memorial services. We saw those incredibly funny memorial services. Those people didn't give shit about the dead. The Kappas never seemed to care at all about their own members or anybody else who was killed. Even Grace and Pete. I mean, even those two, they wanted to solve the case like the Scooby gang. It didn't really come up to, like, save lives or whatever, because no one really cared or grieved for the dead. So this was just, it was an, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was an improv. If Kiki Palmer snuck it in there because she treats Zayday like a character. Good for her. If it was a written line, then good for the writer. But it was the first time this episode, and maybe the first time in several episodes, where one of our characters, who we really like, actually displayed an emotion that would be displayed by a human being. I mean, I get that this is a comedy and grief isn't funny, but hey, in this scene, Zayde showed compassion, warmth, humanity. It was, dare I say, realistic. Like someone might act if they actually had a heart and feelings. There's not very much of that in this season, and none of it in this episode, so... It really jumped out at me. And then we spend a few minutes following the Chanel's and their new life in the insane asylum, in which they turn it into a sorority chapter, more or less. It was um, harmless filler and fluff. It didn't bother me. Until the end, where um, Chanel lays down to go to sleep, and the Red Devil Killer pops out, ha And then makes a stabbing motion as if he's going to kill her. Now, this ending, this ending, this happened. And then it goes to black, it goes to credits. Fuck you guys. Uh, hopefully, Mike will access our reaction video footage, but when it ended, that's all I could do. I just stared at the camera, and I said, Fuck you! And Mike couldn't even say anything. He was just... It was the world's longest and saddest face palm. Mike was just holding his face in his hands. I don't think he was crying. I'm pretty sure that he wasn't, but I think on the inside, he wanted to be. It was just... 
you know, he was in front of me, so, you know, you don't do that shit. But I think it was there. The sadness was real. Like, you guys dropped the ball, like, totally with the, this episode. I mean, you just fucked it all up. Your fervor to explain everything, you just created more lo- loopholes and made more things that didn't add up. But worst of all, you took away the sense of fun, the sense of discovery of like, oh, all right, we get to find out who the killer is and their backstory. None of it made a lick of sense. None of it was fun at all. And then you throw in that pop-up ending. Awful, awful. You're not going to kill anybody. You're going to throw in this pop-up ending. It's a slap in the face. I loved Scream Queens, honestly. What, 11, 12, 13 episode season? And the finale of it was so bad, it's going to make it hard for me to recommend. And this was an easy recommend. This is one of my top 10 shows of 2015, even with this ending. It's still in my top 10, because overall it was very funny. But I guess my recommendation is going to be, oh, if you haven't seen Scream Queens, watch it till the end. Just don't watch the end. Who's going to be able to resist, right? You've made it that far, you've got to see the ending, you've got to see how it plays out. And that's the kicker. Anybody who watches the episode, anybody who watches the season, they're going to have to watch this episode because they want to see the resolution. And the resolution is so thoroughly motherfucking unsatisfying. My name's Nate. This has been the final review, episode review, for Scream Queens Season 1, the episode The Final Girls. My final review, my rating for the episode, I'm going to give this one a 2 out of 10. I might, I might rate it higher. If it was a regular episode, I might rate it a little higher. But this was your big finish, and it was a complete fucking flop. I'm supposed to pick an MVP for the episode, because we always pick an MVP, a most valuable performer, for each episode. This was really tough. There were so few good moments, and uh, nobody really got the spotlight to really run with. I will make the final MVP a no contest. There is no MVP. Sorry. I'd really love to. I'd love to give it... I mean, I could give it to Zayday, but it would be for one off-the-cuff line. Is that really enough? You know? I don't think it is. No MVP. Two out of ten. Far and away, the worst episode of Scream Queens out of the entire season. Way to fuck it up at the end, guys. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Now. See, don't mean to... Uh, laugh at that but i mean that is uh what else can you do at this point i mean we all pretty much felt the same way i have to say and i i'm gonna start this all off by saying uh telling you a little the story of how you know the reaction video i've talked about it a little bit but i'm gonna tell you the full story of the reaction video right now before i get into everything else and what happened was nate and i were very excited about this as you can imagine we've been sitting around for whatever 11 weeks i guess it all comes down to and very excited like all of you to finally get to watch this we watched the last episode of shows together we usually watch them separately then get together and record weekly and same thing we did for scream which you should check out our scream reaction video that one's actually very entertaining that one's a lot of fun we get together to to record this time and like I said we've been planning it for a while I show up to his house with a sack of cheeseburgers I brought my brother I brought him along for tech support because I borrowed my buddy's video camera who shot all of the arrow in the head videos with me at spooky empire tracked him down an odyssey that was that should just go to show what I was willing to do for this episode so get over to his house we're all very excited the first episode starts you can find our review for episode 12 dorcas elsewhere on the channel and that one finishes and we're like okay well that's not so bad i mean there's a lot of places this could go episode 13 the final girl starts and basically right off the bat as you guys well know they give away the killer in the very first, I would say, minute of the episode. Now, I will go ahead and tell you a little bit to get into the review. I actually like that aspect. I have no problem with that aspect. That was ballsy, that was subversive, that was fun. That let us know that this entire episode was going to be the back 
story. The flashbacks to everything you'd seen thus far and you got to see them planning and trading off and this that the other for the rest of the season. This could all be very interesting so I was into the idea that this episode gave Hester away so early after the fact which brings me to now I am a pretty smart guy. I have taken a lot of writing courses. I went to the New York Film Academy. I have read all of your screenwriting books out there. Save the Cat. I know all of this. I've read Sid Field's book. I've read all of them. And I've watched a lot of movies too. I really like whodunits. I get it. See all of this stuff. I'm not a, I'm not a dumb guy. How this episode presented it all, and this speaks to how the series loves to sideswipe you and, you know, basically just trick you, which I'm fine. I've loved every trick thus far. But was I the only one, and I don't think I was because Nate was sitting right the fuck next to me, that it took me, I wouldn't say half the episode, but I'd say a good 25% of the episode to really realize that they were saying that she was the Red Devil. Now, haha, you can go ahead and start laughing at me, but the thing is, if you've listened to our previous videos, I had a whole theory, and if I was f fucking right about one thing, I wasn't right about much, but if I was right about one thing, it was that Hester is the bathtub baby. Okay, so I knew that that was gonna happen, or at least I thought that was what was going to happen. Hester was you know, in cahoots with the killers and that she basically was never, it's a little bit different. I said she was never allowed to be a killer because of her neck brace. I just took that her neck brace was real. That ended up not being true. But again, like most things I'm going to say, and I don't mean to be arrogant, tell me if you agree. I like my theories better than what we actually got. But anyway, so I took her neck brace to be real. That's why I thought maybe she just never got to be inside the Red Devil costume and that the bathtub baby was not actually inherently a murderer. Now, a cohort to the whole thing, absolutely, but not a Red Devil killer. And if you look back at the entire episode, that actually is true. Now, my whole theory went that Grace was framing her and that Grace would be revealed to be the mastermind. As it turns out, there was no reveal of any mastermind. There, okay, there is a mastermind, but the mastermind is Gigi, we find in the last episode. They say in promotional stuff, and a lot of people have pointed out, the mastermind is revealed. Hester was not the mastermind by any means. I watched the episode three times now. Basically, the only thing that she comes up with is picking the Red Devil costume because a guy literally shows up right in front of her face screaming, uh, and that gives her the idea. She's not the mastermind, Gigi was. That is not a reveal. As we find out later, she killed Pete in this episode, meaning, she says later in the episode, I didn't kill anybody, I killed Pete, but he was already a murderer. Okay, so what this basically means is we've been waiting all season and this episode to get the final Red Devil, Devil Killer, and before this episode, because remember Pete dies at the beginning of this episode, before this episode, Hester was not a killer. Now, we've all talked, and we'll talk even further about this later, that the reveal is really pretty lame, pretty fucking obvious, and I'll get into why specifically it is. I'm not just saying that, oh, it was obvious. I'm going to tell you why it was so obvious and why it doesn't work being how obvious it was. But let me just finish up this thing of the reaction video. Like I said, we might release that someday. As we're sitting there and the episode is going on and on, I literally go from the edge of the couch, riveted, edge of my seat, to slinking back further and further into the couch. Nate talks about this a little bit in his review. I'm not going to elaborate much more, but he said that at the end of the episode, it looks as if I wanted to slash was man crying. Man crying is basically when, uh, you know, no actual tears come out, but every other symptom is there. And I could believe that. That's how it felt. The thing is, okay, I keep track of a lot of stuff and this was the worst sin that this episode committed to me, a super uber fan who was, it didn't disappoint me like the Lost Final and it didn't suck, although it did. It didn't suck in ways other finals or movies that I've been excited about have done. What it did was confuse me. I seriously felt 
felt like I was being pranked. I seriously just sat there for a while asking him, dude, I mean, is this a, is this a joke? Like somehow did they film an alternate ending and then, you know, accidentally release the fake joke version? I mean, it was just so utterly confusing because it seemed like this show was running at like a Swiss fucking watch. I put a joke on Twitter, which said the writer's room of the final Ryan Murphy turns to Brad and Ian. Hey guys, let's write the final episode of our murder mystery series. Brad and Ian say, okay, great. Ryan then turns to him and says, okay, but let's add in a twist. Okay, let's take out all the mystery. Dot, dot, dot. And then let's take out all the murders. Long pause. Brad and Ian. Yeah, that sounds genius. Hot damn Shazam. That's seriously how I feel about this whole thing. Uh, it, 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 it was a joke. Somebody, I think, it, uh, I, I actually can't name names right now. Sorry, guys. But somebody pointed out, they were like, they scary movied us. They fucking scary movied us. And I totally get that. And I get that, evidently, as it turns out, Brad, Ian, and Ryan all believe that this show was nothing more than a comedy. And that is fucking bullshit. Is we did not sit here for the last last 11 weeks to get attached to these characters to con let them continue to be a joke like it did it doesn't work that way now before i get into my review i'm doing air quotes here before i get into my review which is not going to be positive i want to give you guys a new theory that i have because i had to come up with something i mean i like i said i was just so confused watching it over three times now afterwards i was so confused i think it's just a reflex of mine at this point to come up with theories so I have a theory for you guys that makes the episode a little bit easier to handle a little bit better. Okay, so I put this on Twitter too. Make sure you follow us there because that's where all the thoughts usually form first. So I put out something that I th said, okay, so American Horror Story, when it first came out, nobody knew other than Ryan and Brad, well, you know, and Fox and everybody involved, whatever. They didn't release it to the press. American Horror Story was an anthology. They did not release that information until after the show it aired so I watched that series it was truly effective because you know we expected the next season would carry on with them so when everyone died it was really surprising it was really crazy I think you see where I'm going with this I think that their new trick is that this is a surprise ongoing series now the worst part of all of this and what makes it slightly bearable to watch this episode now is giving them the benefit of the doubt that that was not their initial plan I don't think that they were lying when they said Said, the killer will be revealed, the mask will come off, which he specifically says the mask will come off and the killer will give a monologue. None of that stuff happened. Uh, and he also notoriously, as we all know now, said that only four people would survive. He amended it to four, possibly five people would survive. And then we got 10 people, all the major people, all survived. To give them the benefit of the doubt on all of this and hopefully reshape everything until we learn, which I have a feeling we'll learn if we're getting a season two within the next whatever seven days from Tuesday so this coming Tuesday Wednesday hopefully we'll know uh, if not Monday because they like to release movie news on Mondays so I'm thinking this is what happened is the reviews have not been good even though there's the DVR thing and da 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 they're still not that good they're not that great and the critics haven't been that great whatever so there's a big thought that there is not going to be a second season I would say that that's still probably pretty possible but they that they have such a good relationship with Ryan that they are basically going to give him the second season, which is good for us in the end, but it wasn't good for us this last Tuesday. So this is what I think happened. The reviews weren't going so great. They had the idea of carrying this on as a soft anthology for characters carry on. It would be called Scream Queen Summer Camp. Then recently I've heard there are whispers. The design has changed. Yeah, no shit. They were going to make the anthology, but think about the difference between this and American Horror Story. If this doesn't have the viewership and the reputation that it was supposed to, if they're going to give Ryan his second season, they had to make a clause because there's no name recognition. This show is not going to just hold up to what everyone liked was the characters. And so more and more at first they started keeping the characters when they shouldn't have or didn't plan to is more how to put it. Case in point, that is why Denise and Chad are hardly in this last episode. If you know 
notice, Chad is hardly in the last few episodes, and neither is Denise. This is why. And this is harmless, and I'm glad that they did it. But they decided to keep them around when they shouldn't have. Denise was supposed to die in Pumpkin Patch. This is why. After Pumpkin Patch, we have episode 6. She's not in it at all. Then we have episode 7, which, yeah, that's when she be she moves into the house. And episode 8, she becomes, she's not the house mother yet. It gets a little confusing because, you know, she's barely in some of these episodes. Then she becomes the house mother. That whole thing didn't work out. They just totally dropped that. See, we all know that they didn't know what to do with her. Then they make her the chief of police. So anyway, she was supposed to die in Pumpkin Patch, and I figured this out. Specifically, there's a line in the beginning of 4, Haunted House, which, if you notice, TV shows tend to, if they're going to do something, they set it up the episode before. If not much earlier, they usually set it up the episode earlier. If you noticed in um, episode 8, uh, Denise says, oh, I'll throw myself down that overly dramatic staircase in the next episode, Hester falls down, and it's a way to keep that fresh in the audience's mind. Anyway, in the episode four, Denise comes in and says, some golf frat douchebag got his arms chopped off. She's so funny. I love her. Anyway, so she finishes up that uh, talk to everybody. If you remember, she looks up to the sky and is like, Shondell, I promise by Halloween night, I will avenge your death, baby girl. That was her basically sentencing herself to death. She was supposed to like Sam and we'll get into all of Sam's thing, but she was supposed to no doubt get ver- the Red Devil would reveal itself. She would find out, but she would die in the process. That was her setting up her poetic justice. And then with Chad, this is the thing, is Chad is fully set up in Thanksgiving. We meet his family, this, that, the other, yada, yada, yada. Chad, I believe, was supposed to die in Thanksgiving. That would would have been a great send-off for him. All makes sense. It's all there. Hester was there to do it, even though they don't they took that back and I'll, this fits into the season two theory why they took all that back and why nothing makes sense is because with season two they wanted to keep Leah Michelle and if she was like an actual killer they would have one had to kill her to put her in jail or three just had her survive but as a crazy psycho disturbing killer and unredeemable if you notice they make sure by the end of this episode and I'm just jumping all over here she says she didn't really kill anybody she is as guilty as any other character. If any other character didn't actually kill somebody, they systematically set it out that they at least tried. The only reason Grace isn't a murderer for Dean Munch is because Dean Munch is unkillable. But every single character is now on level playing field. So in season two, when it's going to now, which they didn't expect, continue all of these people's stories, they, yeah, Leah will very easily be able to be morally redeemed in the eyes of the audience, as Chanel puts it. And all the Chanel's will get out of the asylum, yada, yada, yada. Um, so anyway, let me backtrack. Okay, so Chad dying in Thanksgiving. Chad was supposed to die in Thanksgiving. We know this because in the next episodes, Black Friday through these last ones, if you notice all of his scenes from then on all take place inside and directly out front of the Dickie Dollar's house. They basically had him con- contract to be in 10 episodes. If you look, Glenn then went off and started shooting some movie where he plays a soldier. You can see pictures of him doing that um, on his Instagram. So Glenn leaves to go shoot this and they're like, oh, well, we can fly you back for basically one day or whatever. And they just went to the Dickie Dollar's house and filmed all of his scenes. If Yeah, if you notice even his thing with uh, Denise outside Dickie Dollar's, they'll be back for next season which is good if it actually gets renewed. The thing I'm said I'm waiting for is it takes seven days for the Nielsen ratings to come out, plus what people are going to be saying about this episode will influence if Fox is going to give him a second season, but being that it's Ryan Murphy, I bet you anything he gets a second season, and now it will continue. Now, with the last shot with the Red Devil uh, stabbing, quote-unquote, uh, Chanel, do I think that the next season is actually going to pick up the Red Devil story? I'm not sure. I think that they don't even know that yet because they had to scramble to make the last episode coherent. I'm dead serious. That, watch the episode again and for how much it doesn't make sense and it's confusing and it's lame and there are no payoffs for any of the things that were set up is that Leah was the best 
catch-all. Like I said, she was supposed to be the red herring. She was the bathtub baby. She was weird. She was this, that, the other. They're better writers than this. But she was able to play the catch-all. That is why she is never an actual, like, killer. That is also why the Pete thing doesn't ring true. Pete was used to be, again, the catch-all because what they were trying to say, and this is why they put Gigi stabbing the shit out of that uh, mascot, which, by the way, makes no sense. Why did nobody ever wonder where that mascot went back when the show was being realistic and people noticed when people got murdered but whatever small thing anyway so back to pete so pete was yeah made to be the catch-all at this point because there were certain times where it couldn't have been boone or it was two of them or it was this that the other data 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 and the pete thing worked a little bit better but still it doesn't ring true to you guys does it there's something just not right about that basically the only reason because of what he killed dodger Ooh big fucking deal that was just to give uh and i do like that scene i'm not talking bad about it i'm just it reinforces my idea that it was off the cuff is why did they have him kill uh roger no real point other than they wanted him to kill someone more than just nobody basically um red devil doesn't leave people alive the red devil definitely wouldn't bother to leave pete alive so in the 11th episode as they started trying to set this up that's why they introduced the pete was friends with boone thing so late with by the way chad in the dicky dollars again picking up scenes trying to make this first season have somewhat of an ending and be coherent so anyway they throw in that element pete plays catch all and we do not get the ending that was designed to be the ending of the show i don't know if it is my theory because everything lined up every single fucking thing lined up for it to be grace there's a lot of stuff that still doesn't make sense and i'm going to go into all that stuff specifically then w what's the deal with the uh, grace talking to the red devil beforehand you know and somebody would could say oh it was a later scene but they both it just so happens that her and wes are both wearing the same clothes and they look pretty different as we know abigail breslin has gained quite a bit of weight they shot that sequence at the same time they shot the sequence in the pilot that those shots were shot during the pilot so that doesn't make sense anymore who the fuck was she talking to anyway and then they couldn't get uh nick jonas they couldn't get ariana ariana grant grande there was just this rush to try and get some kind of ending put onto this uh season don't hate the episode too much it sucks but again you have to give them credit for being the, i don't even know how long they had to come up with this Leah said something. Her and Kiki and everybody were given the scripts for the final. That's how she found, when she found out she was going to be the killer. Quote unquote, when she was at a press event with Ryan, Kiki, and uh, whoever else was there, which she's talking about that live New York event that happened. I went and checked the date of that. That's October 25th. The episode to air right before that was Pumpkin Patch, five episodes in. So they had written the final script by the time the fifth episode aired, which all of the ratings had been dropping at that point. Either the script that they gave them was a fake meant to, you know, throw them off. And then they would give them the real pages where Grace was revealed at the very end. And only a few people would know about that. Um, or it was already by that point that they were like, we're not renewing you for a second season with the name banner. You got to bring all your actors back. And they're like, shit. Now we got to start saving everybody's life. Um, thank God we had already planned on saving Denise and Chad. How it all basically comes together in my mind is that we did not get the episode we were intended. We didn't get the ending we were intended. And will the Red Devil return? I could definitely see the Red Devil returning, but in a twist of trying to keep it fresh and everything is it might be a new costume like technically we might not see the red devil costume again but the killer reveal at the end of episode uh season two will be a continuation of the red devil just not wearing the uh mask now i don't mean that that's hester what i mean is it's closely tied like grace would have been is now they've gone back on that but maybe um Hester now will just not have like they're gonna have to pick up a bunch of pieces but Hester didn't ever know that Grace was in cahoots I'm sticking to this fucking Grace thing I'm telling you it makes a lot of sense 
Anyway, uh, Leah even said she thought it was Grace. But anyway, what are you going to do? Yeah, and it all will come back because it has to do with a lot of the viewer questions that I got and a lot of the loose ends, which, I mean, whatever, fuck it. We'll just, we'll go into uh, all of this right now. Um, let's see. Uh, this is more some episode review stuff. I'm all just looking at it as I'm talking uh, to you guys. And these are criticisms that, like I said, won't really continue if I'm right and it was these really three talented writers just having to scramble at the end eh, I'm gonna I'm gonna include an episode like specific review at the end uh, just as a if that if my theory isn't true and I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt if that turns out to not be what it is yeah fuck it I'll let loose my tyrant on the episode specifically um, they're just way too smart for all these problems. But anyway, let's see. Uh, okay, first, these are all the clues, indications that the series will continue. Uh, Hester's eye injury, she specifically points it out to be temporary. Um, this is so, in season two, bringing Leah back, she won't have to wear an eye patch all the time. She'll just basically be back to normal. Okay, this is one criticism, but I do want to kind of point it out, is... Oh, uh, well, again, no. This is a clue that they're too smart to uh, fuck this up. Is that she finds the neck brace, and the neck brace was supposedly part of some kind of plan of hers to uh, trick people and all this kind of stuff, as opposed to my theory, which is that it was real, and that's why she wasn't allowed to be the Red Devil. They said that it was her way of, like, hiding in plain sight. Total fucking lie. Do not buy that for a second. Because if that were true, why did she get rid of the neck brace quick as shit? But like basically the first opportunity she got, she got rid of it. Same reason that the neck brace mysteriously came back. A bunch of people asked me, but I never even bothered to answer it because I just didn't give a shit. Uh, not about your questions, but about the th through line. Is why did Hester's uh, neck brace come back later in the season? Okay, well I looked into all that stuff now. Hester's neck brace comes back in at the very end of episode 9. She got rid of it at the beginning of 3, and it comes back in 9. That, again, means that it was a late addition. What happened right before episode 9 was episode 8, playing catch-all, where they revealed that Boone wasn't actually gay. Next thing they do is they give Hester her neck brace back. Why did they do that? Because they they knew it was irrelevant as writers to the ending they had designed. But when they had to come up with the new ending, they had to make that neck brace a more like pivotal element. Because, uh, you know, that's what gets her into the school. And yada, yada, yada. It's a bunch of shit, truthfully. So now they're like, okay, well, we can't have Grace be the killer. And we don't want to kill Grace or Zayday. So why would we do that? And it's because Hester thought they were nice. You know, I'm not even really going to go into all of that kind of stuff because it's just so fucking silly. There's no answers to it other than they wrote this in a weekend. Yeah, why did they make her treasure? Why did Grace and Zayday, one, stop thinking that she was the Red Devil? I traced that scene back and everything Hester says, Grace is always like, no, you faked your transcripts, you this, that, the other, da-da-da. She even says... Um, Oh, well, who told you that? Pete? And Pete's a killer. And Grace still doesn't believe her. Grace makes the turn. 180. Totally dropped. Totally forgotten. When the parents show up and her and Zayday are like, Oh, wait, you're the actors. You know, you're not actually family. They're still on it. Leah says, Oh, they were in the CIA. That is the moment that they turn and stop caring. So you're trying to tell us that Grace and Zayday not only... Stop thinking it was Hester because, oh, yeah, her fa her parents must be in the CIA. That just makes me hate them for being stupid. Same thing with Denise. Falling for everything Hester said. I really like um, Denise, so it doesn't fully sink in. But you kind of hate Denise for falling for all that stupid shit. You wanted her to be good, to be right by the end. But also Grace forgets, and Hester points this out, is that... Grace and Wes don't know that, you know, they're all related. Bullshit. Fucking 
uh, Grace already knew that. And if Grace didn't think that she was the killer, because she never necessarily said she wasn't the bathtub baby, so she would still fucking know. So Grace just ne mysteriously forgot about that. A lot of people forget a lot of stuff. Um, if her plan was to stop, Hester says, I don't plan to murder anybody ever again, so she can be a good character come season two, unless I text and drive outside the memorial. She says this to the dean. Uh, if your plan was to stop murdering, why would anyone ever believe Grace? Like, why do you have to fl frame the Chanel's? Why do you have to go through all this? Why do you have to get away with murder? As she says, we know that Boone was the uh, Red Devil. We now know that Gigi was the Red Devil. We now know that Pete was the Red Devil. The only thing that wouldn't make sense, and we all know that these cops are all idiots and everything, is who killed Pete. But Pete was a murderer, so you could have just, you know, said or killed Grace. Uh, which I can kind of understand why she wouldn't want to do that. But just like fucking no one's going to believe Grace. Like you could have been a hero for saving Grace from Pete basically. There's no need to come up with this overly elaborate plan. That scene, Nate goes into that and I'm not going to go into it. That scene where she's re like framing everybody. That scene is painfully bad. And the reason that scene is painfully bad is because yeah, we already know that she's the killer. But it was such time filler. And the reason they're doing that, again, is they had to write it in a weekend. They had no fucking clue how to fill that time. So they just filled it with such fucking silliness. So anyway, like, you know, I'm not even uh, going to go through. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, uh, mm -mm -mm. and I appreciate everybody who sent me. I got quite a few people who sent me all their questions and pointed out all of the logic flaws uh, but there's a lot of them, and I keep getting more and more every single day. So, we all know, massive flaws, that's why. Um, so, let's see. Oh, one thing that I do think is kind of irrelevant, and we'll see how they handle it in uh, Season 2, the only thing that doesn't quite fit into my theory, but, you know, maybe they just missed it, is that Hester says that she's not a killer. One, of course, the big one is who killed Gigi. That's not what I'm getting to. But you're right, nobody ever answered who killed Gigi. We never knew who was behind the mask for Sam. If it's not uh, her, then it would have had to have been Boone or Pete. Neither one of Pete said specifically he didn't do it. So I believe Boone was dead for Gigi. So who killed Gigi? Um, and who killed Sam? Because Sam's like, oh, I knew it was you the whole time. Um, they didn't even film the shot of it being Leah. They could have. They very easily could have. Uh, they wouldn't have even need to bring Sam back. They wouldn't have even had to go into the basement because it's so dark in that basement. They could just have shot a shot in basically a dark room of Leah taking the mask off and looking down at her. Like it wouldn't have had to been connected. The reason they didn't do that is because they didn't want it to be Leah in the costume because then Leah would have been the one who killed Sam and they don't want to make her a killer. Um, but they did fuck up because Hester is a killer of more than just Pete. She killed the pizza man. Again, in this, uh, in the last episode <clears throat> where they're having to backtrack and make up everything, they slipped up in their trying to exonerate Hester from like any more guilt than the Dean or anybody has in that, yep, she's the one responsible for that bomb unless we find out that she's not. So yeah, she actually has killed somebody. And that brings up the point two of Melanie Dorcas. They brought Melanie Dorcas back to really not do anything with her because she fits into an overall theory that I have that I've uh, figured out and uh, I really want to get into on how I would have ended the show. I'm going to tell you exactly how I would have ended it, but we'll do that at another time. Is that Melanie was set up so she had to be paid off, so they just paid her off as quick as they could. But... This is the thing about Melanie, is they set her up to be the Mason Verger, as Nate pointed out in his Dorcas review. This is my whole thing. I never, I don't think, told anybody how I thought Melanie fit into everything. Melanie is Bruce Wayne. She's uh, Mason Verger. Melanie is not a Red Devil. Melanie was, and that whole thing with Hester and Boone putting the acid in the spray tanner, I don't buy that. I think it was supposed to be Grace or, you know, maybe it was Hester and uh, 
uh, Boone, and that's how Grace learned about them is because she was in the house. She would have heard her scream. Grace was probably supposed to be the one who goes and helps her, saves her. So she forms a relationship with uh, Melanie Dorcas, who tells her all of the secrets of Kappa House. She's always obsessed about finding her mom and stuff. So that led her to Gigi, da 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 da. But um, Melanie's whole thing, and if there is a season two, it'll finally come up, is that Melanie is a millionaire. Melanie's uh, whole thing is she's the financier of the Red Devil outfit. Pete even says in the last episode, not the last episode, the second to last episode, Dorcas, he says it's a conspiracy. There were multiple killers. Now, I'm not saying that there's like this huge conspiracy, but I'm saying that it definitely could be. Um, anyway, at least enough to Grace and Melanie. So Melanie's the one who pays for all this stuff because they're all poor, crazy people. You know, they don't have any money. And what makes me think, it's like, oh, well, that's just suspension of disbelief. No, because um, Boone specifically says to, <clears throat> uh, as turned out, Pete, bullshit, uh, it turned out, he says to Pete, I uh, bought this hotel suite with uh, money that I borrowed from Chad. That's because he had to do this on his own and Gigi wasn't going to give him the money for a hotel suite <clears throat> and neither was Melanie. Whoever was funding all of this stuff and it would be expensive to be Batman, it was expensive to be the Red Devil. And they try and like whatever with that they stole Chanel's diner's club card, that's fucking stupid. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's how she'll eventually work in. So they just wanted to show her a little bit and pay her off for earlier. Um, yeah, and again, uh, a little slip up on their part. A little slip up, all these, whatever. Uh, this is fucking stupid. Anyway, um, let's see. What did Chad have to do with the mystery? Nothing. He was supposed to get murdered. Yeah, and just stuff like this. If the twins wanted to get revenge for their mom... This is why I also think it was something that me and Nate have touched on a little bit, that the overall thing, and this will work well going into season two so they don't have to spend all the time at Kappa House, is that the whole plot was never actually against Kappa. Like Gigi's, Boone's, and Hester's was. The overall was not. That is why the pledges, let's just say, the pledges were killed. This is why in insubstantial people were killed it was all about protecting kappa house not destroying it this is evident in the very first kill the red devil commits okay so he goes after melanie not about that the first person that is actually killed by the red devil is chanel number two what is chanel number two doing at that time she is leaving Kappa House. She's giving up on Kappa House and leaving it and probably going to tell on Chanel for the murder of Miss Bean, bringing down all of Kappa. It's going to be a big thing. Red Devil kills her to protect Kappa. Same thing with everybody, basically. Um, after episode five, like I said, it gets muddy and then it started to really, the wheels came off. But anyway, um, <clears throat> So if the twins to get revenge for the mom, why let the Dean live when she literally prevented justice from being served, cover the other girl's butts and ditched their mother's body in a shallow grave? Exactly. They were not meant to uh, be able to kill based on the 1995. They were the henchmen, crazy henchmen recruited to carry out the dirty work, but they were not the actual people because yes, if they were, they would have gone right after the Dean and they would have gone after Wes, who was the father. These are the only people connected to the mystery, which by the way, we never got uh, Cohen, Coco Cohen. Now, a lot of people have said, and I could believe this, that that's Chanel's mom. I totally could believe that. That's why we got that offhanded joke about Oh, your parents just disown you. We got to see everybody's parents basically throughout the series. Never got to see Chanel's. Why? Because her mom was always meant to be Coco, but then it was just there was too much to fit into the ending. Um, <clears throat> and the other is like Coney. Totally forgot about Coney. Totally forgot about a lot of stuff, which would be fan service and 
they're too smart. They would not have just let Coney uh, go by the wayside. Um, yeah, why doesn't the Dean get her comeuppance? Because she needs to be in season two. Um, uh, why do Grace and Wes forget all of the evidence stacked against Dean Munch in her husband's murder? They all know by this point that she did murder. So why do they just forgive her and ride off into the sunset? Because this was written in a weekend and they want uh, to set up Grace, uh, Wes and Dean Munch. It will be a funny thing for season two. Same reason that I mentioned this in Dorcas, when they're in uh, bed afterwards, Wes and Dean Munch, Dean Munch is like, you need to get rid of Grace, da da da, and it's made to almost be a thing, and then again, completely forgot about, forgotten about, because still, I think in episode eight, they were like trying to keep their shit together, and then by nine, they were just like, I, I fucking, I don't even, I don't even know anymore, man, like, Fox is telling us this, that, that, none of this makes sense. Fuck it. Like, um, everybody will hate this episode. Everybody will know that it's stupid. Everyone will uh, be confused, hate it, but we'll redeem ourselves in season two. So if we don't get a season two, like I said, whatever. But expect um, either Monday morning or, like I said, Nielsen ratings take until Tuesday that we will get a second season and it will continue this story. Oh, and then that fucking bullshit. Uh, if the Dean <laughs> recognize again, late edition, that's fucking stupid shit. That is first draft of a screenplay, never should have left the office bad. It is, yeah, if Dean Munch could recognize a baby's face, not only is that stupid, but whatever, I'm will, I'd be willing to buy that. That's fine. Is that, why would she never say anything? Like, no, there is no, no fucking backtracking possible any given way you cut it way that she, that makes sense. That is by wor far the worst sin that this episode um, committed. And just look back at episode four's um, flashback where she's talking to all the f girls who are in the grave and if why she covered up the murder initially if she wanted so bad to... I'm fuck it. Yeah, I'm not even gonna go into it. Um, why target uh, pledges? If why kill pledges if your targets were the Kappas? Weren't they nice like Grace and Zeta? Exactly. Exactly. Again, fucking flaws. Yes, they were because that was not the initial plan. Okay, so basically this functioned as a review. My killer reveals all all everything that I planned on doing all muddled in together. Yeah, sorry about the length of this, the muddiness of it, the rantingness of it, but God, I hope this sheds some light. And if nothing else, I hope this creates a discussion between us that you agree and it finally at least makes sense. I know you guys are as confused as I was. This was my way of trying to make sense of it and it actually does make quite a bit of sense. So hopefully you guys can sleep a little bit tighter now and know that we only have one bad episode to deal with in Scream Queens season one and hopefully two. This was this bad episode is the price we had to pay to get more episodes. So uh, that'll help you sleep better at night. Now you'll be able to watch it and enjoy the comedy, which is uh, there are some really good moments with Chanel and look, don't you want to look back at it? Shit is so fucking funny. And then, of course, one of my favorite uh, lines of all of uh, of all of Scream Queens is when the judge says, you did your... And when Nate hated this part, which I can understand, but, I mean, this line is really funny to me. Because he's like, your entire defense consisted of you telling, screaming at the jury that you were... Uh, that you were not guilty and that you would murder them if they found you guilty. Or paraphrasing, but... Fuck, that shit is too fucking funny. Um, but yeah, my final rating on this episode, I'm not doing this to be cute. Actually, I kind of am. The final uh, rating is a zero. One, it was terrible. Two, there was hardly anything redeeming, but it's not really a joke, being that I don't think this episode was ever supposed to exist, and if it was, it was not supposed to exist in this form. It gets a zero because this episode should not be. It is a fucking travesty that just needs to be put out of its misery 
and was born out of circumstance and bad juju and happenings and bad ratings. Put this episode down. Let's forget it ever happened. Zero. Okay. Anyway, if I think of more, I'll uh, put up some more stuff. I'll talk to you guys down there in the comments section. I'll put some stuff up on Twitter. And we have a few Screen Queens videos still coming up for you. We are going to do, of course, Killer Congratulations. That's coming up next week. We definitely want to uh, celebrate everyone who uh, picked right. And at the same time, we're going to do our full-on season review. You know, might touch on some of this stuff a little bit more as it sinks in a bit, but I've been thinking about this for a long time, and that's why this is kind of rantish, because I really just... There was no way to structure any of it, because it's fucking confusing. So hopefully you stuck it out with me the whole time. Hopefully... Hopefully I'm right. Hopefully I'm right. We'll see, hopefully very soon when season two is confirmed and all right well i will see you next week guys with the killer congratulations let me know what you think and whew, we made it through it now hopefully we can see it in a slightly positive way even if we never want to watch it again all right see you later guys